Aloha kako. Welcome to Anahola Baptist Church with Pastor Kenny Elledge. We are searching the Holy Scriptures today, so get your Bible and ekomomai, join us. Chapter 14 begins Tuesday, uh, two days before Passover. And in his last record of what has taken place on Tuesday, he tells us that the chief priests and scribes decide to wait out the feast and the crowds before arresting Jesus in verse 1 and 2. Instead of chronologically going with more detail of what happened or what unfolds on Wednesday, Mark then moves back in the history of what has taken place in this near time to Friday. Friday night, uh, would be Saturday as the Jewish reckon as the Jews reckoned it. This is prior then uh, to Jesus' triumphal entry. And the scene there that he records for us is this great picture of love that Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, bestows on Jesus. And I argued last week as we looked at that great picture of love that is really contrasted between the enemies of Jesus, both in verses 1 and 2, the scribes, chief priests, and then we see in verse 10 and 11, Judas betraying Jesus. And between those two uh, events, there is this woman who loves Jesus dearly and understands who he is, where everyone even besides Jesus at the dinner don't understand what she's done. And you could call them haters in our jargon. They have thoughts to themselves. What is she doing? Ignominy in their hearts towards her. And they even scold her outwardly. And we know and we, I believe that it was Judas who said, why was this not sold and so we could give it to the poor? And John adds a footnote that he did this because he was a thief. And used to steal from the bag. He was the treasurer of the group. And used to steal from the money bag. 300 denarii, that's a year's worth of money. And Judas had an appetite for money, as we see today as well. What becomes plainly evident in Mark is that Jesus is surrounded by people who still don't understand who he is. That's what makes Mary's gift all the more evident is that she seems to understand. But what I want us to remember is that everyone in this scene is opposed, it seems, to Mary. Jesus says this story about her is going to be told as a memorial of the gospel. And we really see that. I pointed that out last week. We really see the gospel displayed in what Mary did. She gives this exorbitant gift. Christ gave himself for us, the greatest gift imaginable of love. And though everyone opposed her, we know Jesus stood up for her, but when Jesus died, everyone, there was no one defending him. And everyone cast their teeth at him. And so this really is a picture in Mary's offering to Christ of the gospel, and she is memorialized. Because of that. This morning as we come, again, we didn't get through the Judas section last week, but it works out well because we begin and we end with Judas today. Isn't that a contrast? I never want to begin and end a sermon. If I were preparing a sermon, I don't think I'd ever begin it and end it with Judas. That's not, 
That's what you get when you go through scripture verse by verse, chapter by chapter. Sometimes that's just how it's laid out before us. But I think it gives us a good opportunity. Remember, one of the things I want us to keep in mind is that it wasn't the intention of the chief priests and scribes to kill Jesus this week. Remember verses 1 and 2? They decide, hey, it's next week after the feast. We don't want the people getting angry with us. But something comes along that they weren't expecting, something in God's plan. And, and this is central to what I have to say today. All of this happens according to God's sovereign, eternal plan. Things that we don't expect, we wouldn't ask for, we wouldn't plan for, are unfolding according to God's plan exactly. Last night, Brother Victor shared with us a, a devotional that he prepared. The men, when we gather for meat, barbecue, we don't just gather to be gluttons. I want you to know that. We do hear testimonies, and we do hear the word, and it, it was edifying. And he pointed out how trials are according to God's purposes for us. It's not accidents, and neither is this greatest of trial that we're coming into, which is the crucifixion of Christ. The center of all history was according to God's plan, and central to that plan is Judas. And we see his true colors. The first point this morning is Judas's true colors, verses 10 and 11. Then Judas Iscariot, who is one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. And when they heard it, notice their <laughs> verses 1 and 2, we're going to wait, we're going to put it off. When they heard it, they were glad. What a thing to be glad about. This sinless man the Messiah who is promised to them has come, has lived among them, has shown every demonstration that he is the Messiah, and they're glad when they have someone to betray him into their hands. And so they promised to give him money. We know this is 30 pieces of silver, and he sought an opportunity to betray him. Judas is seeking, and I want us to hear that. It is all a part of what Judas wants. He's seeking an opportunity He's doing what he wants to do. And, and some of us, where we're sitting in our seats, we can't even fathom this. But I want you to know if you're a Christian, you can't fathom this because you have been given the gift of life. You have been born again. You have the grace of God upon you. But for a sinner who is dead in their trespasses and sins, he sees an opportunity. To betray Christ. If you're a reader of this gospel in the first century, Mark wants you to be prepared for this already. In chapter 3, verse 19, when he gives us the list of the 12, he says this about Judas. His name is Judas Iscariot, so we know it's the same one who betrayed him. Sometimes we're so familiar with the text, we don't remember what it's like to sit down from the beginning to the end and just read through this gospel. But he wanted you to know before this happened, this is one of the 12 who was with Jesus and he's the one who betrayed him. John says that Judas was the one who protested that the oil should be sold and given to the poor. But he adds, because he was a thief, as I've said. The question that needs to form in our minds is how do we go from verses 1 and 2 with the chief priests and scribes wanting to wait a week not to kill Jesus the week of the feast, the Passover feast, unleavened bread, because so many people were there. And now being excited, and we know they seek actively to arrest Jesus and then put him to death during the feast. What transpires? What changes all of that? And the only answer that I can see is not an explicit, this ergo happens there, you know, but it's implied that Judas is the reason. And, and isn't this the case that when we, that we are often emboldened when something happens that we don't expect? And what they didn't expect was one of the 12, one of the closest allies to Jesus, his inner circle, one of his disciples is eager to betray Jesus. And it changes their whole demeanor. Now they're glad, 
And they're glad because now they can go through with their plan sooner than planned. Judas's betrayal, as I see, is the only thing recorded for us that indicates the change of mind of the chief priests and scribes. If Jesus' own disciples are willing to turn against him, the rest of the mob will be easy to change. What mob was that? That was the mob that was present at uh, triumphal entry. Hosanna to the son of David. How do you get that mob? I, I believe they didn't comprehend what they were saying, most of them. How do you get that many people to just days later, five days later, saying, crucify him, crucify him in unison? How do you embolden that? Well, you, as the chief priests and scribes, are the leader of these people. And if you're emboldened and they don't understand what they're saying, you're emboldened by one of the, his disciples betraying him, then you go through with it. Then you go through with your plan a week early. They planned a week's wait, but God had appointed that his son would die during the feast. And certainly this is because of all the pictures, all of what is coming to pass during this feast of Passover is part of what we'll read today is the scriptures that must be fulfilled concerning Christ. You see, when we see pictures like the redemption of Egypt or the redemption of Israel out of Egypt, that is not, and I want to say this, I'll say this multiple times, we should not understand that in the first place or fundamentally as merely referring to a nomadic people group that would be called the Israelites. The big picture of history concerns Christ. And those things that happened to them happened in order to prepare the world for him. For Christ, who would come through just as God had promised, according to the scriptures, the seed of the woman, the seed of Abraham, the seed of David. He would come to fulfill the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump. He's speaking now to the church. As you really are in leaven, for Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. I'd love to just preach on that verse alone. Second main point. The feast begins 12 through 21. And on the first day of the unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And point A here is Monday Thursday. Now that really comes from John's gospel, what we call Monday Thursday in Holy Week. Verse 12 in Mark indicates that it's now Thursday of Jesus' Passion Week. The first day of unleavened bread coincided with the sacrificial, the, the lamb that was to be sacrificed and then eaten that evening. Almost all New Testament scholars, even past and present, agree that Jesus died either 30 or 33 A.D. And we know from historical and even astronomical uh, studies that Passover preparation fell on a Thursday of this week. So the meal would fall on a Friday and then Jesus would be handed over to the hands of sinful men on that Friday and crucified Friday. And I just point this out to to just demonstrate that this is the timeline that we see also in Mark here. The Passover lamb is killed Thursday. It's prepared. Then they prepare. We'll see the upper room and everything that goes along with the Passover meal. And then they eat it on the evening of what we would call Thursday. But for them, this is the beginning of Friday. Passover meal would be eaten. And sometimes people struggle with that chronology and for various reasons. But one of the reasons is that Jesus says in Matthew 
uh, 12, verse 40, that Jesus would be like Jonah, right? As Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, so would the Son of Man be in the belly of the earth, or the heart of the earth, for three days and three nights. And they say, well, Friday doesn't give you three days and three nights. And I remember having those qualms myself, and I, I probably have talked about this already, uh, but I want you to understand that I think from Mark's perspective, we must understand this is Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Thursday is the killing of the Passover land. They eat it Friday night. Jesus is killed Friday before Sabbath. He's buried in the tomb Friday, Saturday, Sunday. He rises very early in the morning. This is the chronology of Mark and Matthew, and I believe John, if understood correctly. But what about the saying of Jesus? Well, the first thing and the, the ultimate thing about this is that we don't often understand idioms of other cults, cultures and customs, do we? If you and I say in a, in a, in a note to our children that a thousand, two thousand years from now, uh, I want you to take a minute to clean the house. And they find that two thousand years from now and they'll say, they can clean a whole house in a minute? That's incredible. They must have had super speed back then. No, right? We understand that's an idiom. That's a way we express a short amount of time. Take some time and clean your room, right? But we don't always understand that from even foreign cultures and customs, let alone ancient foreign cultures and customs. But to the Jew, a day was a Something, if something happened on a day at any given time, it was on that day, just like to us. If you went to the store yesterday, we don't believe that means you spent 24 hours night and day at the store. Right? But what you did yesterday is what you did yesterday. That was the day you spent at the store. And this is a, an idiom. And scholars can show, and I, I think we could go a step do a study going back into the Old Testament where we can see the sort of languages being used idiomatically to say three days, three true days. Jesus would die, he would be buried for three days, and he would rise again. So this isn't an impediment of us understanding the chronology the way that the scriptures give it, which is that Jesus would die on Friday. Now, I just say that because sometimes our conscience, sometimes I get... Why do you celebrate Good Friday? That's a Roman Catholic idea. It's not. It's not. Therefore, as Jesus died on Friday and was entombed part of Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, part of Sunday, his word is true. Mark 15, 42 and 43 says, And when evening had come, since it was the day of prep preparation, that is for the Sabbath, he says, that is the day before the Sabbath, Sabbath, was Saturday in the Jewish reckoning. Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council who was himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Jesus dies Friday. Joseph seeks to take his body and entomb it before Sabbath, which is Saturday. And we know he rise very early on the first day of the week. And it's important to understand, then, that this coincides with a faithful biblical accounting, what is unfolding here. This Thursday, when the Passover lamb would be slain in preparation for the meal, that following evening, which to the Jews would begin the Friday. And this is the beginning of what's called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It coincided with it, which would last for seven days before the Passover, or with the Passover. Verse 16, and the disciples set out and went to the city and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. And so we see B, a place prepared, verses 13 through 16. And he sent two of his disciples, and we know this is Peter and John from Luke chapter 22, verse 8, and said to them, go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, and wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room? where I may eat with, the pas 
eat the Passover with my disciples. And he will show you a large upper room furnished and ready there prepare for us. And the disciples set out and went to the city and found it just as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover. Now this scene, if you remember just a few chapters back in Mark 11, is very familiar to when Jesus sends two of his disciples to go get a colt. Remember, before he enters Jerusalem. Very many parallels are here. He uses two disciples as he did there, which is most likely because in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word will be established. These are witnesses that come from their teacher, their master, saying this is what the master told us to do. The person who hears them understands that this is a true witness and testimony. Now, whether or not this is supernaturally ordered, Jesus knows what's going to happen, and he sends his disciples. He sends them to look for a man carrying a water jar. Now, that was uncommon. Just like the Syrophoenician woman at the well, it was common in those days that a woman would be carrying water jars. Men, ironically, would be carrying wineskins usually. I'm not going to say any reason why that might be, but that's generally what the men carried in those days. Women carried water jars. Now, as they go into the city, Peter and John, they would recognize this is unique, this man carrying. So people would, well, how does this man stand out? And I always thought, well, how did they recognize this particular man? Well, it's because he was carrying a particular object for that time. And the teacher says, this is their testimony that they were to tell the man, where is my guest room where I may eat with the Passover, the Passover with my disciples. And many scholars believe that Jesus had organized this or uh, made provisions beforehand for this. But, but it is possible he just knew beforehand that this man was going to be there. It was common during these feast days that Jerusalem and people that had space would be prepared for people, uh, an enormous crowd of people to come and they would prepare places for those people to have their Passover meal in the city. In any event, all of this unfolds as Jesus had prepared or had told his disciples in advance. Everything happens. And we, we find there that disciples were to prepare the Passover, which they did. Uh, about a Baptist pastor, uh, John Gill, describes preparing the Passover this way, and you could find this in Exodus chapter 12 as well. So they bought a lamb. They had it killed in the temple. That was a sacrifice, which illustrates a substitute for the people. Remember, the firstborn or a lamb, according to rule. And they brought it to the house where they were to sup, and they roasted it and provided unleavened bread, picturing the removal of sin from the people, and wine, God's blessing of the people, and bitter herbs, the suffering of the people in Egypt, and everything that was proper for the feast. But for us, it's under, we need to understand that these are things that Jesus takes for himself. These symbols re regard Christ. He is the lamb slain instead of us, the substitute. He is the one who removes the sin of the people. And he is also the blessing for the people of God. Because he bore the scorn and the shame, the bitterness of our sin. And what we deserved because of it. The first Passover details all of this, Exodus 12, 1 through 27. And it was meant that they were, the, the children of Israel, as they came out of Egypt, they were meant and God meant for them to observe this yearly, to base their whole calendar year, the beginning of their year cycle on this event. God redeemed them this way from Egypt. And now, according to God's plan, his son has come. And the picture is so clear and obvious that what was pictured in a temporal salvation for Israel out of Egypt is for all of those who believe the gospel, not just for a temporal time, to be delivered from the hands of our enemies in this world. 
but to be delivered forever because of Christ. And so we remember him, and we will remember him, God willing, next week, as we'll see the Lord's Supper and what is instituted for us as a memorial to remember our Passover lamb. We will partake of. Exodus 12, 26 and 27 says, And when your children say to you, What do you mean by this service? You shall say, It is a sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, Yahweh's Passover, for he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshipped. Next week, as I said, will be us taking a perpetual memorial until Christ returns of what he had done for us when he fulfilled this picture in himself once and for all. But before entering into the supper itself, Mark once again brings us back to one of the central themes of this chapter. That is the betrayal of our Lord. See. The certain woe of Christ's betrayer, 17 through 21. Before we go there, remember what Christ said in his high priestly prayer in John 17, 12. While I was with them, he's praying to the Father, that is the disciples, while I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except the son of destruction or perdition, that's Judas, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Now, pay attention as we read verses 17 through 20 in Mark. And when it was evening, this is now Friday, according to the Jews, he came with the twelve, and as they were reclining at table and eating, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. Now, As Jesus says this, I can't help but to think what Judas is thinking. He's already gone to the chief priest. He's already made the deal. He hasn't followed through with it. The betrayal hasn't occurred yet. I wonder what was in his mind. I wonder if he was alarmed or I wonder if he was cold. I don't know. They began to be sorrowful and to say to him one after another, it is I. There's no reason for us to think that Judas wasn't one of them. God help us not to be hypocrites. He said to them, it is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the dish with me. Again, John 13, 26 and 27, Jesus answered, It is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. And he gives it to Judas, and nobody understands what's happening. We don't know if that happens here after verse 20 exactly or when, but at some point this happens. And he tells Judas, What you're going to do, do quickly, as Satan possesses him there in the upper room. The disciples didn't understand what Jesus said even at this point. They seemed to never understand until after Jesus is raised from the dead. And I think for us, we ought to confess we wouldn't have either. Our faith is a gift. It's not for us to boast. It's for us to glory in Christ. God. Jesus knew the point I want us to understand here. He knew exactly who it was who was going to betray him. Mark doesn't say that Jesus knew exactly, but he did know exactly who it was that would betray him. Jesus was a lamb. Before his shears was dumb, he opened not his mouth, but he was not ignorant of anything. But he still went. Anybody ever has been betrayed by someone who they were close to? 
one of their closest friends or loved ones, relatives, know how difficult it is. The patience of Jesus is so far beyond me. I'm coaching a soccer team, it's eight and under, and I've always regarded myself as not, I don't have the makings of a good coach because when I get into sports, I turn into a, like a wildebeest, you know, a weird person, you know, in my past at least. And I just didn't know if I could coach children because if you see children, they don't listen, they don't often know what you're saying, and, and when you get a group of them, they turn even more unruly. And, and imagine how much more unruly we are to someone who's sinless. And I have to keep reminding myself, they're children. They don't know what they're doing. They, but we, we willingly sin and oppose God in our hardness of heart. Even when we know better, we do it. Jesus, he was patient. <laughs> like, I can't understand. He's sitting there with this man who he gave power and authority to heal sick people and blind people and deaf people and to cast out demons who he showed himself to, the power of the kingdom, who he taught in the most intimate ways, and he's looking at him right across from the table, eating a meal with him. And he patiently bears it to save us. To save us from our sins. That song, he could have called 10,000 angels. He could have done that at any point during his life or ministry if he was just fed up. But he desired and loved to do the will of the Father who sent him. To save us, he bore with it. But it was going to come at a cost. He knows who the betrayer was, and he says in verse 21, For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him. But woe to that man, that's a curse, by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. This goes back to what he says in his high priestly prayer, that phrase, Son of Destruction. He's born for this. And it would have been better for him not to be. As we close, I want to point out two essential truths from this text as we've been seeing it before us. God willing, and summarize it. First, Jesus submitted himself to Scripture because Scripture is the Word of God. Listen to what he says. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him. Jesus does not submit himself to myth of man's making or wise moral developments of a human religion. He submits himself to Scripture. He says what is written obvious allusion to the scriptures because it is the word of God. It is true. God's word is his story of redemption through the son. This means that what was written before Christ was written in preparation for Christ. And all of it true. All of the promises and commandments given to the patriarchs and people of Israel were for them, but ultimately was through them that God was going to bring the one who would fulfill that word. What does that mean? Well, think of Matthew 5, 17. 
the Sermon on the Mount. Think that I am not come, think not rather that I am come to destroy the law and prophets. I am not called to destroy but to fulfill. And here's what I want us to understand. All of those things that happened in the Old Testament were not fulfilled by Israel. They couldn't be fulfilled by Israel. They had failed in every aspect of them. But does the word of God fail? No. How would the law be fulfilled? How would the promises in the garden to the patriarchs, how would they be fulfilled? How would the earth be full of the knowledge of the Lord like the waters cover the sea? Because the Jews were so good at obeying the law, over and over and over again, no, 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 the answer only comes in Christ. He came to fulfill what was written, and what was written fundamentally finds its foundation in him. He says, John chapter 10, that scripture cannot be broken. Luke 16, 17, our Lord says again, It is easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail. Why is that? Didn't the law fail? Didn't it fail? Israel failed, Hebrews says. But Jesus didn't fail. The righteousness of God is revealed in Christ. Beloved, in fulfilling the scripture and saying the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, Jesus is putting upon the scriptures God's own authority, God's own plan in motion, his purpose and salvation. And he's saying, I am the fulfillment of it. It's true. But he's also relating something of his own word in relationship to it. Because he just said in Mark 13, 31, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Jesus is the word. But this plan of God is so beyond our comprehending. But Jesus is saying now, I submit myself to scripture. It is true, but I am true. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. The truth of God could not fail, beloved. Christ could not fail. God's plan must have been fulfilled, and it was. Do you look back on Scripture, and does it in, instill in you a joy in, in your faith? Does it inform you in all of the obscurity of what we can know in this world? Isn't it amazing? We are in the world of Google where you can go and find any recipe you want or anything you seem to want, and we don't seem to agree on any details. Now, new sources, we have never been, as far as in my experience, briefly, so confused. I look at the world, and it's like God is just confusing the languages all over again, the peoples. But this word is true, and it's point is found in a person and Jesus says it must be fulfilled and this is the answer why the plan of the chief priests and the scribes in verses 1 and 2 doesn't happen like they plan it happens like God planned all of Passover the first Passover was meant to be fulfilled fundamentally Ultimately, in Jesus. And he would be sacrificed on that week. And God appointed Judas just for that purpose. Maybe not just, but at least for that purpose. To see to it that that would take place. 
Remember what it said. Jesus says, for the Son of Man goes as it is written of him. But that had to include what Judas had done. And that's the second point. When we come to this text and when we come to Mark, it is plain that one of his purposes is to show that God's plan stands against the plans of men. In other words, God is God and we are not. That is one of his purposes here. And we call that a doctrine of predestination. And people scoff at this doctrine and they say, if God is foreordained whatsoever comes to pass, as the Westminster Confession rightly says, then it doesn't matter what we do. We're just passive. But just as the scriptures must be true concerning Christ, so they must have been true concerning Judas. John 13, 8. But the scriptures will be fulfilled, he says. He who ate my bread has lifted up his heel against me. Quoting Psalm 41, 9 about Judas. The scriptures, what is true, what God gave beforehand, had to be true And for it to be true, it doesn't just concern his son, it concerns all the things that surround the son. In this context, Judas is at the center of that. Judas was described as the son of destruction. He was born for this end. It was better for him, Jesus said, that he was not born for this end. And some people excused Judas and he said he only acted under possession of Satan, but Judas goes willingly to the enemies of Jesus before that possession takes place. That we can tell. And he was already robbing. Yes, he was under the dominion of Satan. Satan blinded his eyes, but he was doing what he wanted to do in opposition to Christ and in fulfillment of the word of God that he would fulfill the scriptures. His actions took place out of an evil heart, willingly opposing God's will and yet fulfilling God's plan. Let us never be like the foolish scoffers who say, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? Romans 9, 19, speaking of this very truth about predestination. We stand back with our limited understanding and we say, if he was born for this, then he has no culpability for his actions. And yet the scriptures say, it would have been better for him not to have been born because of the judgment he would receive. As a result of his evil Romans 9, 20 and 21 summarizes the problem of those who kick against the doctrine of predestination like this. But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Well, what does molded say to its molder? Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel of honorable use? In our, in our scene, is there a vessel for honorable use? Christ and another for dishonorable use. If in our ignorance we reject God's sovereign rule, you don't just reject a part of who God is, you reject God for being God. Judas was culpable for his sin and will be judged Forever, rightly, because he did it willingly. And this is a mystery that we can't sort out, but this is the record of Scripture. And this was according to God's purpose 
which stands against all the plans and schemes of men and will stand forever. Mark is painting a picture of God in this chapter and of Christ who is far beyond our ability to control or resist. Or call into question what he has decided to do with his creation, to manifest his glory. If we kick against this doctrine, we don't just kick against Judas, we kick against Jesus. Jesus is the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. That means God knew that man would fall into sin, planned that man would fall into sin, made provision for that sin, chose some. That doesn't mean he chose the others equally, but it does mean he knew beforehand in his plan to save some that there would be others that would not be saved in his plan. And we cry out, we don't comprehend it because as Christians we look to ourselves and we say, I am not more worthy than Judas. Or at least you should. Because the truth of this doctrine says that all of us were dead in our trespasses and sins. And all of us were under the dominion of the prince of the power of the air. The children that are now at work in the, or the, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, we were in that group. We were enemies of God. We are not better than anybody. You see, this is also the grounds for our boast to be only in the Lord and not ourselves. Our boast to only be about the praise of Christ and of God and of his love. Rather than to say, it was me a little bit. I'm a little bit better than him, aren't I? Because I have to have that in, in order for us to understand it. Beloved, that does not alleviate the problem of understanding still. I'll tell you that. But what it does alleviate is the opportunity for Christians without holding anything back to say all glory, all power, all blessing, all honor be unto the Lord. For I know that I don't deserve this. It's God who shows mercy. And he does it according to his word. And Christ knew that. It must be fulfilled to save us. And so what will our what will our response be? Because this is just the beginning of the betrayal, isn't it? What was said about Christ as the Lamb will be more explicitly Declared before us as we go, and the word of God will be proven to be true in every detail. And that plan was for your salvation. His death was for his people who once were part of the children of darkness, enemies of God, but are now children of God, sons of promise. And so the question is, what do you believe? It's not for us to sort out the secret things of what God has planned from before the foundation. It's for us to hear the message. It's for us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Paul, or Paul, nicest thing I ever said about you, Kyle. Kyle was teaching this morning about how we are taught in Scripture that 
No one is outside the boundaries of this proclamation. Go into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. All kinds of people. The worst of sinners. Kings. Every type of person in every position needs to hear this message so that they would be saved. And we call them to it. And we, we call them to believe in this great love and to repent and for God to show mercy and to give grace and to awaken the dead from spiritual death to give them life. And how do we hope that they will hear? It's because God is able to save. Let's pray. Father, thank you.